Klein, Ms. Quirk. Uh, I'm a master's student in the Applied Marine and Watershed Science Program up at CSUMB, just down the road. And I do want to talk to you today uh, about my research. I also want to talk to you about some experiences that I've had um, that have kind of helped point me in the right direction towards my career um, as an environmental change biologist. Um, I swear I don't bring these up just to talk about myself. Um, I bring them up because these experiences are some of the most formative in my life, uh, but also because they're still so important and relevant to me that I think that they actually actively aid me in my role as a researcher and as a science communicator. But first, I want to turn it back on you, the audience, for one second and have you guys ask yourself one question. What brought you here? And it's kind of broad, I know. And I don't mean uh, what brought you here to Moss Landing today uh, or even how you found your current program. I mean, what, which experiences uh, in your life, voluntary or involuntary, uh, lit this fire under you to pursue advanced study in marine biology? What gets you up in the morning and allows you to say honestly, yeah, I think my work matters? Because I'm pretty sure it's not the money. <laughs> For me, it started here, in New Hampshire, my lovely home state. I spent a lot of time in these frozen mountains growing up, uh, romping around in the woods with my closest friends. Uh, and they had a big impact on me. I grew up thinking that access to pristine wilderness like this, these are the white mountains of Hampshire, was something everyone, was something everyone had. Uh, everyone had access to this. Uh, and that a sense of environmental stewardship was just a quality you had if you were a human being. Um, I think we all know that I was mistaken. Um, I first got the sense that things might not be as rosy as I thought um, out there in the world when I went to uh, college at Syracuse University. I was studying biomedical engineering at the time, super important and fascinating stuff, um, but I also started learning about environmental issues, and those are the ones that really stuck with me. Um, this connection to nature that I had fostered back home kind of kept bringing my mind back to um, the, the uncertain and rather unsettling state of our natural world, which are, I'm sure we're all very familiar with. And then, in my junior year of college, I had an amazing opportunity to study abroad in Ecuador and Chile. This map is just to refresh, just in case. Um, beautiful, right? Uh, the, the photo on the left, actually I have a little picture thing, is uh, the Pastaza River on the edge of the Amazon Basin in Ecuador, and these are the Andes Mountains in Chile. Now, it turns out the environmental situation in these countries um, looks a lot less like this, and a lot more like this, and like this. This is accumulated trash um, on the island of Isabela in the Galapagos. This is smog covering the city of Santiago in Chile. The cold air from the mountains, particularly in the wintertime, uh, traps the hot air rising from the city and makes this really nasty, dense layer of smog. Um, sorry. Um, all these effects have arisen in part because um, looking to the U.S. and other developed countries as models, uh, these countries have adopted quasi-capitalistic economies, and with them are capitalistic consumption habits. They are producing more trash and burning more fossil fuels than ever before. Oh boy. It's not that they don't care about the planet, it's just that they've only really recently realized uh, the necessity of environmental education and the importance of conservation. So seeing all this firsthand, let me to realize one thing above all, that the fight for the health of our planet is the fight that's gonna define my generation, I think, our generation. Ironically, I also think that we're so fortunate to be alive today. Um, we're witnesses, I think, to a crossroads in human history where the very things that have allowed us to prosper and evolve as a society also now have the potential to wipe us off the face of the earth. I just think it's kind of cool to think about the fact that humanity has never been here before, you know, and, and we're here to witness it and to help out in any way we can. So as I explore climate change a bit more, I realize that the oceans uh, are one of the areas in which, the human, in which human impacts are gonna manifest themselves most strongly. It's where most of our trash ends up and they're susceptible to rising emissions in the form of ocean acidification. And we barely understand the oceans even without those problems, right? And so, by simply being alive and connected to nature at this defining moment in human history, and also being lucky enough to be born in a country where I could acquire 
the knowledge and resources to do some good, I realized that this was a moral obligation. I couldn't simply sit back and watch the planet I love to suffer. And that is why I moved all the way out here from New Hampshire to study and to fight with all of you. Currently, my research is focusing on the, on the effects of ocean acidification on these guys, Sebastes mystinus, or the blue rockfish. I'm also looking at copper rockfish, I just didn't have quite as charismatic a photo to throw up there of them. Um, as we all know, rockfish are abundant out here in the uh, California current in the North Pacific. Um, and they're an important sport and commercial fishery all up and down the West Coast and into Baja, California. So we're looking at blues and copper specifically because one, they're abundant out here in the bay and they're easy to get. Two, because they have really interesting life histories that we think may have endowed them with different capacities to, te to tolerate and potentially adapt to ocean acidification. For example, they spend different amounts of time in upwelled waters. We all know that um, northerly winds in the spring and summer, right around now, start blowing and start moving surface waters offshore, which allow deeper water from, um, that is naturally uh, colder and more acidic to be brought up and bathe our giant kelp forests. Blues, blue rockfish, spawn in February and March in winter before these strong upwelling events occur. Copper rockfish, on the other hand, spawn in April and May during these intense upwelling events. Additionally, uh, they have, um, they recruit to different depths in our giant kelp forests. Blues are what we call benthic benthic recruiters, which means that when they're young, they spend most of their time near the bottom, where the water is naturally more acidic due to various biological um, and oceanographic processes. Coppers, on the other hand, are kelp forest canopy recruiters, which means that their environment is generally less acidic, but it's much more variable in terms of acidity, temperature, and a bunch of other physical factors. So these differences in these species' life histories, even though they're congeners, led us to formulate the general hypothesis that different reproductive and life histories lead to differences in ability to tolerate changing ocean conditions. Um, and you'll notice the conspicuous lack of results that I have in my talk today. Um, and so that's why I'm kind of integrating this narrative as well. Uh, but I will explain a little bit about my methodologies. Um, so my work, um, is focusing on the acute response of rockfish to OA. We know that upwelling events are often occur on the scale of hours or days, and so we think that there may be some really interesting gene activity happening in these fish uh, during these, you know, these fleeting baths of acidic water. So what I did essentially is I held juvenile coppers and blues in low pH seawater treatments, if they had a pH of 7.2, for five days. Um, I sacrificed them and harvested their organs, um, and I'm going to isolate a wonderful little molecule from their tissues called RNA. Uh, RNA, or ribonucleic acid, uh, is a relative of DNA. And so with the right enzymes, I can actually convert RNA back to DNA and then send this DNA off to get sequenced um, at, the, at the Vincent Coach Genomic Sequencing Lab at UC Berkeley. Um, and then I can examine how these fish are changing their genes and thus their bodies in response to ocean acidification. Uh, I'm going to be doing this via a technique called RNA-seq. It's actually pretty cutting edge. It's only really been used. Um, started to be employed widely in the last five years or so. Um, I'll be following a data processing pipeline established by the Palumbi Lab uh, down at Hopkins Marine Station uh, called, the, fittingly, the Simple Fool's Guide to Population Genomics via RNA-Seq. Um, and I don't have time, unfortunately, to get through the whole um, pipeline right now, but essentially, I sacrifice my fish, I collect their tissues, I collect their RNA, I reverse transcribe their RNA to DNA, I send it off to get sequenced, I get the data back and run it through this series of, of programs um, and manipulate it. Um, and the information that I get back is essentially a collection of all the pieces of RNA that were present in that rockfish tissue at that particular time. Um, at the end, I can identify what's called differential gene expression, where it's essentially the genes that these fish have turned on or off to cope, adapt to, or tolerate their current acidic conditions. And with that data, um, the idea is that we can hopefully help predict changes in behavior, recruitment, and abundance that will hopefully inform management of our rockfish fishery out here going forward. Now, the focus of this colloquium is marine science communication for the 21st century. So when I try to explain this to non-scientists, even in layman's terms, you know, as soon as the word molecular gets out of my mouth, their eyes kind of glaze over, um, and they often completely tune out. So I'm left with the question, how else can I communicate the importance of my research? Uh, what else am I left with if even a toned down version 
isn't enough. One answer are my stories, the ones you've heard today. Um, if we personalize our passion and describe to people why this science matters to us, then I think we stand a chance of getting through to them. If we show them that we're personally invested and that we really do care deeply about this work and about the threats our oceans face, then I think we can show them that we aren't up in some ivory tower as scientists, but that we're just humans who care a lot about our family and our friends and the planet that we all share. And so my final request from you guys, my peers, think back to your answer to my first question. What brought you here? I'm guessing that most of you have some pretty cool stories to tell about your work or about life experiences that could potentially help inform um, your explanation of how you became so invested in this field of research. So I implore you, share them. Find creative ways to explain your position. Make it accessible. Share, uh, use your experiences and your passion uh, for something more than just a savvy cover letter. After all, if they got you this far, what more can they do for you? What more can they do for the oceans? What more can they do for us? Thank you.